Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and as you saw with the thumbnail, the next biography series will cover the Rock of Chickamauga, George Thomas. In this video, we discuss his childhood and his time at West Point. The childhood of Union General George Thomas is a mystery, a mystery that historians have attempted to piece together over the years. One reason that it is difficult to explain the young life of one of the Civil War's most standout generals is that he ordered his personal papers to be destroyed after his death, including the letters to and from his wife. Add on to that, Thomas was an intensely private man who spoke little about his personal life. He himself stated that, All that I did for my government are matters of history, but my private life is my own. I will not have it hawked about in print for the amusement of the curious. Nevertheless, some historians have been able to piece together some semblance of a childhood for the man. He came from what would be considered an upper middle class household. His father's family was from Wales and his mother's family, the Rochelles, were from France. Her family were Protestant refugees that came to Virginia in the late 1600s. The Rochelles were much more affluent than the Thomases. Nevertheless, John Thomas would marry Elizabeth Rochelle. Thomas would be one of nine children born to the couple in Southampton County, Virginia. When George was born on July 31, 1816, the family lived on a 438-acre farm with nine slaves and six draft animals. By the time George was 13, the family owned 685 acres and 24 slaves, placing them among the wealthiest 10% of white families in the county. His father John served in the Virginia militia during the War of 1812, but saw no combat. At the age of 13, George would lose his father to a farming accident. The death of the patriarch of the family put a financial strain on the family. Elizabeth kept the family afloat by selling off some of her land and turning to her family, specifically her brother John, who was the Southampton County clerk. Her brother gave George's oldest brother, John William Thomas, a job as a deputy for the clerk. Although a multitude of crops were sold in that area of Virginia to the outside market, the Thomases maintained a successful brandy business. Then their next biggest financial staple was hams and other pork products. Because cotton was so profitable, they did grow a small amount of cotton, but their wealth came primarily from brandy and hams. In 1831, two years after his father's death, one of the largest slave revolts in American history took place in Southampton County, Virginia. Nat Turner, an African-American preacher, began telling his congregation stories of the Israelites overthrowing their Egyptian oppressors, and through his religious teachings, organized a slave revolt to take place. It began on August 21st when Turner and a band of slaves began destroying homes and killing whites. By the next day, the group had gotten larger and word about the insurrection had spread throughout the area. The Thomas family was informed that the group was approaching their farm and they began to flee in a carriage, but thinking that Turner might have guards posted on the road waiting in ambush, they got out of the carriage and traveled across country through woods and fields and swamps to the town of Jerusalem eight miles away. The Thomases left their slaves on the plantation. Their black overseer hid and watched Turner's band take some of the Thomas' slaves with them. The overseer then rounded up those who were left and made their way to Jerusalem and reported what had happened to the family. Eventually, those slaves who joined Turner from the Thomas plantation found their way to Jerusalem and told the family that they had been taken under duress. The militia put down the revolt and the Thomas' slaves were not convicted or executed, so it was believed by the people of Southampton County, Virginia, that they did not take part in the revolt. As George grew older, he seemed to have a distaste for politics. He criticized politicians of the period in some of the letters that still survive. No record exists that he joined any political party or even voted. George's oldest brother helped his mother manage the plantation, and it was expected, as George grew into adulthood, that he would need to seek out a profession. At the age of 17, he applied for a job of deputy county clerk. Although his uncle had passed away, the family's connections secured him that position. He was to study to be a lawyer. As a deputy of the county clerk, he would get to work with court proceedings and legal issues and learn his trade. He would need to study in his own time to pass the bar, but it was a good path on which to be. He was only in that position for a few months when his family got the representative from their district to nominate him to the West Point Military Academy. We don't know why he abandoned his pursuit of being a lawyer. He was meticulous with paperwork, he had an analytic mind, and a great work ethic. Great qualities to become a lawyer and a successful one at that. George left for West Point in May 1836. His brother gave him some advice. 
Having done what you conscientiously believe to be right, you may regret, but should never be annoyed by a want of approbation on the part of others. His family had taught him to follow his own moral compass and make his own choices, and then stick to them regardless of the approval or disapproval of others. John Y. Mason was his congressman. When George traveled to West Point, he stopped off in Washington, D.C. to say thank you in person to Mason. The congressman told him that no cadet appointed from our district has ever graduated from the military academy, and if you do not, I would never want to see you again. He arrived at West Point in June 1836 and immediately went into summer encampment, as all new West Point cadets did. One of his bunkmates was a cadet from Ohio named William Tecumseh Sherman. The other was Stuart Van Vliet of New York. Sherman and Thomas would become close during their time at West Point. In this case, opposites did attract, with Sherman being energetic, impulsive, and talkative, while Thomas was calm and deliberate. At the end of June, both Thomas and Sherman passed the entrance exams and then enjoyed themselves in the military duties of camp life. At the end of the summer, before formal classes started, a ball was held where the new cadets could dance with the local girls. As the school year began, hazing was a common practice between the upperclassmen and the new cadets. However, their hazing did not go well when it came to Thomas. An upperclassman barged into their room late at night and began barking orders. Thomas, being 19 and generally older than all the other classmen, walked up to the cadet and said, Leave this room immediately or I will throw you through the window. The cadet wasted no time in leaving the room. Vliet remembered that no one attempted to haze them again. He gained two nicknames while at the academy, Old Tom and General Washington. Both came from George being older than most of the cadets and his calm, serious tone that made him appear older than he was. He received few demerits, but those he did accrue were from socializing with other cadets during hours that that wasn't permitted. The first two years at West Point consisted of learning mathematics, French, and drawing. Thomas did well in French, but initially had trouble in drawing. At the January exam, he was 50th out of 60 cadets in drawing, but with hard work, he eventually finished 6th at the end of the course. In his second year, he was chosen as a cadet officer and was becoming popular with the other students. One reason is he would protect others from hazing and gave them advice on how to improve their studies and drill. In his third year, George took many science classes, some of them taught by the famous biologist Jacob Bailey. Students would send Bailey plant specimens from their frontier outposts, and that allowed Bailey to have one of the largest collection of plant specimens in the United States. Probably brought about because of his fondness for his teacher and his interest in science, George would send the Smithsonian Institute animal specimens from his various outposts. Thomas humorously described one of his cavalry lessons. We had quite an interesting exhibition here a few days since of the method of using the Polish lance. The performance was by Monsieur Booby, I think. At least that was as near as anybody could come to pronouncing his name, which I think was very well done, for he was certainly the most frightful object I ever saw. Thomas graduated 12th in his class of 42 on July 1st, 1840, and he would enter the artillery. He traveled to New York City to accept his commission as a second lieutenant and battery D of the third artillery. When he got there, the unit was preparing to leave for Florida, where they would battle the Seminole Indians as infantry, since artillery was not conducive to the swampy environment. He passed the next several months in relative inactivity in New York. He passed the time with 17 other graduates, also posted in the city. To further illustrate his disdain for politics, he wrote to one of his brothers in November that, we can learn nothing from the papers now but election news, which to me is like no news at all, for I care nothing about them any further than that they are beneficial to our country. The war in Florida was brutal, and many officers resigned their commission during the war or after leaving the territory. Thomas was not dismayed. He saw the war as a possibility for promotion through the ranks. In December 1840, Thomas's unit was sent to Florida.